George's Jaunty. Now, George's Jaunty is an awesome dude. I got to meet him. Sorry, guys. How you doing? George's Jaunty is an awesome dude. I got to meet him in 2018 at Atlanta Comic Con convention. Uh, me and my homeboy Joe were walking through, and I was wearing a uh, priest outfit, you know. Anyway, so we're in a priest outfit and showed his table, and I got interested by his comic books that he has. Here's one of them right here. I'm just going to show one of them. Later on, I'll have PJ take a look at the rest. But So I saw one of these. I got really interested, and it actually correlates to what's going on in today's time, and we'll get into that when I actually talk to him. But I just want to say a few things. George's Jaunty is a penciler and illustrator for Dark Horse. He has also done some stuff for Marvel. Um, but as you can see, he mostly has worked on Buffy, the American way and some X-Men stuff, um, including X-Men extremists. And, and if you guys hold on one sec, I'm going to get him up and we're going to start with the show. And I'd like to introduce George's Jaunty. Hey, how you guys doing? We're good. We're good. How you doing today? I am well, just working away as I'm sure most people are. Oh, quarantine. Oh, Oh man. Full screen. Man, the quarantine is getting to everybody right now. How are you dealing with that? Well, I, I mean, this really is no big deal for artists. Most of us work at home anyway or work in a studio. We're not normally around a bunch of people. So, honestly, my life hasn't been affected, per se, either way. Okay. Nice, nice. Um, and I'd like to, again, thank you for coming on the show today. I know we met back in 2018 at uh, Atlanta Comic Con Convention. And oh, no. yeah, this is where I got, I believe, the second issue of the American Way. Pat, can you get a shot of that real quick? Uh, the, table. the other table, it the is going table to be. The table is right there underneath uh, Mr. Ashanti's face and uh, under yours. It's oh, it's in the shot? All right. So, yeah, I also want to show you real quick, sir. This is the one that you got me that uh, you signed for me. Oh, the trade. Okay, yeah. oh, cool. Oh, I don't think you can see it, but yeah. So that was a pleasure getting that from you. I'm just a great guy, I tell you. You really are, man. You were so easy to talk to. You came up. You were smiling. You actually looked embracive to the people coming to you rather than kind of stone-faced on it. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, we can argue about the, the the psychology of artists. But, yeah, most artists are just, you know, very shy, introverted people. And and I'm not saying I'm not the same. But I you so after you, you're around a while, you learn to kind of like, Hey, you know, potentially everybody is your friend. Not like, oh, what do you want? Well, you know, what do you want from me? Type yeah. Of the thing. All right. So I just have a couple questions going in for you. Um, first one is being a penciler. Do you get confused as an illustrator? Do you do both? What is the difference between the job? Uh, I do do both. And yes, there is a lot of confusion from people who don't know necessarily what the, uh, the jobs are when you open up a comic book and you see the credits. Um, I don't mind the, uh, the indifference. Uh, I know what I do. And if somebody's actually that interested, you do take the time to explain to them what it is you actually do. Um, the difference is being, you know, the, the penciler, I, I really, I think the penciler is, is a, is a misnomer because what it really is, is a storyteller because it goes from the script to the page and, Theoretically, that's where the story is getting told. You have the story in the script, yeah, but now visually you're telling that story from words, and that's what a penciler does primarily, in my opinion. And then, you know, it's followed by the inker, colorist, letterer, and all that stuff. Right. So, actually, that's a great way to lead into the next um, subject, I will, um, next question I'd like to talk about. In the American Way, which is, again, one of my, one of my favorite comics I read from you, um, that you illustrated. It is good. Where did you get your inspiration for the actual characters like Old Miss and uh, Muscle and, you know, to go on? Uh, with their, uh, and it, it was actually very fortunate for me because when we started that, me and, of course, the writer-creator John Ridley, um, he just had ideas. He had basic ideas. He had names like Old Miss and, and Muscle Shoals and all of those Um and he wanted them to seem very dated because when we initially did this, it was uh, established in the 60s. Right. So in doing so, he just had names that sounded like they could have come from the 60s. And visually, he had a very basic idea of what he wanted. And um, that's where he let me to really fly like here. You know, this is kind of like what I want. But you go ahead and, and establish, you know, 
the, the new American, however you want. He did say, like, you know, the, the new American had to be covered because nobody could know that he was black. Right. Uh, and from there, just he, he was mentioning, you know, it would be kind of cool if he had like a, um, a space suit, like a, an astronaut suit, but, you know, not as bulky. So, you know, you take these elements and then you you sort of streamline them into a, a comic presence. Okay. Now, uh, actually, saying that, it reminds me sort of of uh, Blue Marvel. You remember Blue Marvel, the uh, Marvel character? Blue Marvel from Marvel Comics? Yes. Yes. Uh, he supposedly got retconned yeah. in as the first African American superhero back in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and he had to cover his face as well due to how the uh, public would view him. And I was wondering oh, if like, okay. you had seen it. And when did this that. come out? Oh, man. It had to have come out early 2000s, I believe. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, no, I missed it totally. Huh. Yeah, so it's a fun book. It's a fun read. Um, it's just their take on Superman. But uh, that going on on that. Um, where did you come up with the inspiration? Well, which is, is sad because Marvel actually did have the first black superhero. So I don't know why exactly. they would want with that particular formula. I guess they wanted somebody, again, like Superman, somebody who could take on the century and such. Somebody, I mean, we have T'Challa. Yes, he is the first black superhero. He was as smart as Reed Richards. You know, he runs the kingdom. He is literally the epiphany of black excellence. But they wanted something else of, I guess, power, and per se, of it. Which is a good read. It's interesting, but Black Panther still tops it all. Um <laughs> That said, uh, who who are your favorite? Uh, and I'll go back to uh, the American Way in one second. But who are your favorite uh, Marvel? Let's say three favorite Marvel characters and three favorite DC characters, and we'll go from there. Uh, well, I primarily grew up on Marvel, so okay. I was I was what they used to call a Marvel zombie back in the day. And well, I, I you know that's funny. Your your influences as a kid are different from your influences as an adult. And as a kid, man, I was I was in love with the thing. The thing could do no wrong because. Really? You know, as a kid, you, you want to be strong and you want something that's invulnerable. And that was the thing. And he was, you know, for the most part, he was cool about it. Um, uh, I did. I liked all a lot of the uh, 70s B characters. Um, I love the White Tiger because uh, oh I'm God, partially yes. Hispanic also. Right. And the White Tiger was Hispanic. And I thought, oh, man, that is so cool. And uh, um, God, who else? Uh, you know, I love the Marvel the macabre Marvel from the seventies when they were allowed to do all the horror books again. And uh, Mobius, the living vampire. I don't know why I just thought vampires were cool when I was a kid. And Mobius I mean, who was, didn't? he wasn't a vampire. He was a living vampire. <laughs> exactly. Are you excited for the new Morbius movie coming out? Do you think Jared Leto's going to do good uh, on it? I see a preview of that. And from what I've seen, and I, you understand when a movie, when a movie gets made, they have to take certain liberties and right. you're like, okay, right. whatever. Nowadays, it seems they're keeping more into the comics, which is nice. Yes. And I think the Marvel Universe has has solidified that idealism. And uh, the, from the previews that I've seen, I don't expect them to have the costume because that was silly anyway. But yeah, the look of Mobius did, in whatever little bits that I saw, did kind of come through. So I was happy about that. Nice. And you know, they could have the costume because, I, I don't know, did you watch uh, Jessica Jones? Uh, I am funny enough. I am on the end of the second season, so I don't I don't have it all yet. Okay, let's see. Did they? I don't want to spoil anything. She's dealing with her, she's dealing with her mother and Patsy. Uh, Patsy Walker is uh, doing drugs or something. Okay, so you have seen the one where they actually show her old Jules costume. Uh, her old. I believe it no. was season. Yeah, it was season one dealing with uh, Purple Man. Oh, you mean uh, Jessica's? Yeah. Uh, 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 man, yeah. I saw season one years ago, I have okay. to say, so it's been a while. But yeah, I was thinking if they can show that, whoops, if they can show that costume in there, I'm pretty sure they can sort of vamp the new, uh, no pun intended, vamp the new Morbius costume in there. So I'm Yeah, sure I mean, uh, again, it, it, it wasn't a great costume. And throughout Marvel's history, they'll probably tell you, yeah, some of our costumes were... Oh my gosh! Awful. Yeah, <laughs> but they were of their time, and uh, and revamping it. I'm totally cool with saying, hey, if we can get, I think a lot of these studios now they sort of keep the color scheme, but don't do the character. Which I, I hate to say, I love Luke Cage, the way he looked in the comics, and obviously in the Netflix, they intentionally stayed away from it. But I was really happy that they kept his color scheme yellow. Yeah. Because that was, you know, technically his color. So I, I did like that. 
and you know his hoodie the inside would be yellow which right. you're going okay i can see he couldn't walk around with a yellow hoodie yeah, because, yeah. Uh, it was a nice nod it was cool. a very nice nod to it they did a good yeah. job yeah um, let's see um but then and again sorry going back to american way going back to the american mm-hmm. way um who was your favorite character to develop or to create? Um, which one did you have the most freedom with to do what you want to do? Uh, and you'll forgive me because, oh God, the American way was so long ago. Um, I I mean, the, the new American, of course, the, the black character was really great because that's where the, I guess the biggest arc was certainly his. Right. Um, but uh, what was her name? Um uh, oh God, Amber Waves. Amber Waves. I thought, re- and it's certainly in the second series. It's kind. Of, I don't know. I thought, in my opinion, I think John was a little mean to her in the second series. I was not expecting that but, from her for that to yeah, happen. Yeah, neither was I when I was reading it. To be honest with you, yeah. but I think she had a really. I, I really like characters who have arcs. Okay. You know, they don't just. I think that's always been the big problem with Superman and Batman is that they can't have too many arcs because Superman has to be the Boy Scout. And for some reason now, Batman has to be tortured. And they can't really escape that theme as much. Uh, although I think a, a good writer could do that. But uh, it's it's difficult, granted, when it's serialized and it has to come out every month. But I do, I do acknowledge that it's harder. So with these limited series like this, uh, American Way, it's a lot easier to go from one point and end someplace else. Uh, so I definitely appreciate characters you can give an arc to. Um, do you have a dream project you would like to work on, whether it's writing, whether it's um, possibly um, draw, whether it's possibly um, doing more illustrations? Uh, what universe would you like to work for, if that's the case? Would it be Valiant, yeah. DC, Marvel? Would you like to do something with uh, Icon? Or would you like to do more stuff with Vertigo? How would you like to go? Which route? Yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, all of them, actually. Okay. I, when you're when you're an artist and you draw, you know, artists draw. So it's not necessarily. I only draw for this one thing. Right. Artists, if, if I, in my opinion, if you like to draw, you'll draw whatever. Um, like I said, I grew up with Marvel, so most of those characters are much more um, indigenous to my upbringing. Um, so I would probably favor a lot of the Marvel characters. Although DC was very nice to me when I started in the business. So I have no malice against that. Um, I would love, I, you know, I grew up with Daredevil. Um, I would love to do a Daredevil series, but you know, I was a huge Frank Miller fan. So it was oh, a lot of, of Frank that. Miller. We have a, uh, original Frank Miller Batman comic issue right here. Oh, can you see it? I'll yeah, that, it oh. That's partially invisible. Oh, let's see. Can we get it in the screen? Nope. It's not. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the hardcover, the leather yeah. bound, right? Yeah, so I got this back in when I was like 13. My friend had got it for me, and I love it. Yeah. Love oh, that's, it. Uh, that's a collector's I got that too, actually. That's a collector's item. Hold on to it. Oh, I am. I hold on to it very dear. <laughs> that was very limited. Everything that Frank Miller pretty much did for DC, aside from Ronan. And you're like, damn, this guy didn't do anything with this company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll say, oh. Uh, seeing how you start, seeing how you say you started off in DC, I did want to talk to you um, because you are mixed. You are Haitian and um, mm-hmm. D- Dominican, and uh, Dominican, yeah, and Dominican, Dominican Republic. Okay, nice. I'm very Miles Morales. I like it. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that said, um, was it hard for somebody um, with your background to come into um, drawing art or to draw comics? Was it hard? You know that job. That is is an interesting question on the surface, but in all honesty, it's much more of an irrelevant question. And I'll tell you why, because I was also feeling that when I got into this business um, and, and back in the day, when you get into this business, you didn't you never saw the artists. You never saw the creators who did the books like you didn't know really what John Byrne looked like. You didn't know what Walt Simonson looked like or Jack Kerr. You might have known Jack Kirby. He was more more of a celebrity in the business, but for the most part, you never knew what these guys looked like. You could only go by their name. And when I got to meet George Perez for the first time, I assumed that he was Hispanic because Perez is a, is a Latin uh, suffix that I never knew what he looked like, but I just assumed that he was Spanish. And when I did meet him, we had a conversation. And funny enough, I asked him very much that same question. And he answered very much the same way that, Back in the day, it, it didn't matter because nobody saw you. You know, you 
the bigger thing was that you lived in New York. It wasn't that you were of a, of a certain race. Um, and you could see throughout the comics history, you'll see a lot of artists who were revered that if you were to really research their background, you'd realize very few of them were actually American or born here in the States and, and not of some sort of other lineage. So that particular question, thankfully, in the comic business, I've always felt to be irrelevant because that's never been an issue from all the people that I've spoken with. Now, of course, since we have social media and you can see what everybody looks like, hell, you can see what everybody had for breakfast this morning. Back in the day, you couldn't see that or, or know about that sort of thing. Um, it was much less of a big deal than, ironically, it is more now because, yeah, now we have to have women in certain positions. We have to have a certain amount of minorities in certain positions when back in the day, that was just a given. Like, if you liked comics and you tried it and you were in it, then that's cool. It wasn't because you were the first woman or the first black or the first Hispanic to do this. You were just somebody who, who worked for the cause, and the cause was getting out a book, not your nationality. Nice. nice. That's good to know. That's really good to know. Because, you would, cause, <laughs> um, no, uh, you would think for some reason it would be harder for people of color to get into um, illustrator comics or to be noticed, but to know now that you know people weren't really seen for that they were seen for the artwork that's good to know and i'm pretty sure that's well, again, because for a lot of people our our world was less visual you All didn't right. have you know phones and and computers and things like that obviously so it was much more difficult and you know jim shooter loves to tell that story about how he got into uh, comics he got into comics writing and he was a little kid he was like 13 15 years old when he started writing for dc and it was only because the uh, DC wanted to fly him out to a show or something or, or to their offices that he told them, I have to check with my mom because I'd have, I've never flown on a plane. Uh, that's when they started to speculate. Well, how old are you? And that's where that came in. So these working from remotely back in the day, as we did, a lot of this was, was always a non-issue because you didn't, it didn't matter what that person was. It only mattered that they got the work in on time. And believe me, people were much more concerned with getting the work in on time than they were with whatever your background was. Nice. All right. And to the next question, uh, let's see. Actually, you were saying how he started um, when, he went, when he was a child. When did you actually start? Uh, wanting to draw or did you want to start writing or what was your idea of where you would be now when you were younger? Well, that's probably a better question for my mom because she <laughs> can probably tell you the exact minute and day that I started drawing and I was going to be the next Ro Norman Rockwell. And she, she made that a point to tell me all the time I was going to be the next Norman Rockwell. So there was a lot of pressure on me from the get-go <laughs> to be good, not necessarily in comics, just in general, to, um, to draw. And um, You were going to be big as normal? Yes. Uh, well, that's what my mother wanted me to be. And, uh, of course, that, that, type of, uh, that type of pressure never ends well. So needless to say, I never did become the next Norman Rockwell. But, uh, and she was really against me getting into comics. I, I got into comics reading it at a very young age, as I'm sure most kids do. And then, of course, you grow and you find something else to get into and all that. And, and I guess me, I just stayed with it. Um, so she was a little against me doing comics initially until I brought home my first paycheck. <laughs> and then she was like, oh, you can make money off of this. Oh, go ahead okay. and do it then, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, do this comic thing if you want to do that. So uh, initially that's what I did. And I, I, if you asked her, I, I think she'd tell you I started – you know, I started drawing when I was three or four or something. It was really early. And, you know, as you are, you sort of start drawing the cartoon characters like Disney or Warner Brothers, and you kind of evolve. And uh, I have, like, some early stuff of mine. So if, if God willing, there's ever a book, The Art of Georges Genty, hopefully <laughs> sure I will, will put be. all of that in there at some point Please in my do. life. Please <laughs> do. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um... Now you did a you did a little bit of X Men, correct? Uh, I have always worked on the peripheral of X Men. Yes, I did a Wolverine issue. I did Gambit. I did Bishop. I did uh, the Extinction. It's like I've done every other X book, but something that ended with men. 
And that's what I always <laughs> wanted to do because, you know, as a kid, I grew up reading uh, Marv Wolfman and John Burns and Paul Smith, all the Uncanny X-Men stuff, and I loved it. And I thought, oh, man, I'd love to do this sort of thing. So it never came to pass because I was always on the outskirts of the inside. Mm. With X-Men, I do got to ask this question because this is a oh, – oh, this is a controversial question. No, no, go ahead. Um, yeah. Who was in the right? Magneto – or Professor X? In the right, referring to what? Protecting uh, protecting their people, on how they're going about it, um, on their yeah, on their outlooks of it and their ideals. Who is going who would you well, say is going it, about this the correct way? And you you can appreciate this. Somebody once told me, I can't remember who, or I might have seen this on on video or something, but they had it, um, quantified that Professor X was Martin Luther King Jr. Right. And Magneto was uh, Malcolm X. And they were both trying to do the same thing in terms of, of race relations and here mutant relations. But of course, Magneto was by any means necessary. And Professor X was very passive resistance type of a thing. So I guess it really would determine where your temperament is in terms of change. If you feel that change needs to be taken and you have to force it, and I, and I don't think that's what uh, John Lewis was saying just recently about, uh, well, what was it, good trouble? Try to get into good trouble. Right. Um, this is more of you have to take it from a, a Malcolm X point of view and a Magneto point of view, I guess. This is something where you have to take it, whereas Professor X and and Martin Luther King were more passive, aggressive. We can show change through social endurance, not, you know, by any means necessary. So, um, I mean, that's a, as hard a question as asking yourself, which captain do you like better, Captain Kirk or Captain Picard? Because they were also very much in the same vein. You know, Kirk would just come in and take it, and Picard was very cerebral about it. Right. And I have to say, I, I did I did favor Picard, but there are times where, you know, you feel like Kirk, and you're yeah. like, uh-huh, <laughs> this, I'm gonna just take out my phaser, and that's it. I'm gonna take care of the situation right here. Right. Do you think uh, going forward with X Men, do you think that um, what's going on now will influence the way they are showing characters or relating the characters? You mean what's going on now in uh, our yeah. society socially? Yeah, society socially, um, politically, um, yeah. Uh, well, I think, honestly, that we have been doing, or comics has been doing this for, for many, many years, showing uh, mutants as a minority, which right. they are. If you're going to write about this sort of thing, and, and in all honesty, you know, John, not John, but uh, um, Chris Claremont has been doing that. He, he did it. Uh, more so when the New Mutants first came out, the uh, the off uh, spinoff book from the X Men years ago, that mutants were a, a minority. You know, here nowadays it's blown up to a point where all right, there's so much a minority. Uh, let's do uh, you know get along to uh, go along to get along and uh, separate but equal. We'll even give you your own island and let you live there, okay. which I don't necessarily agree with. But again, comics are an ongoing medium, and you have to serialize it. Right. Um, I I think if some smart writer is is good at what he does, he can definitely use what's been going on right now. But we've already been doing that also in the comics. Uh, Grant Morrison has done that to a, a great degree back when he was doing the X Men. So I don't think there's a whole lot different right now with what we're going on with what's going on in our society with what they can do with uh, mutants in terms of minorities in comic books. Okay. Nice. Uh, just a um, couple more questions and it'll be a little more lighthearted and then I'm gonna let you go. I appreciate it. Um, oh, please. We can, get, man, we can get so deep, we don't even have to come up again. Oh, don't don't get started with me, man, because we, we will not come up again. We will <laughs> not. I got plenty to say on okay. that. But um, on a more lighthearted note, uh, what did you think of um, the evolution of Spider-Man with the new Into the, Vi into the, virus, into the Spider-Verse uh, movie? Uh, what do you mean, the comic books or just the movie itself? The um, I guess the yes, the comic books, the evolution of where the movies are going, animatedly, um, animated, and to what Spider Man we're getting now, and how we're not just getting Peter Parker, but we're getting array. I'll just say array of Peter Parkers, even though they're not. 
Now, this is another issue that I think it, people, in, and there is really no continuity in comics anymore. Any continuity we had ends about every five years, and then you're able to reinvent whatever title you're doing. But I think anybody who, who's smart, who's dealing with Spider-Man in particular, should look at Batman and his role in the 60s and 70s. And it got to a point, which I think it's getting to a point now, there were so many <laughs> Batmen that it had to become the Bat family. And, you know, Batman essentially is a loner. You get that, and I think that's one of the cool things about him is that he's a loner. He'll be in the Justice League, but you also understand that he's the guy off to the side in the Justice League. He's not in there, you know, putting his arms around everybody. Right. Uh, and I I think Parker's appeal, and, and again, this is more generational. When I was a kid, Peter Parker was still in college. Peter Parker was you know, still trying to get money for his Aunt May's medicine, which was really expensive. And he was a part-time scientist. And he was just trying to survive in New York City and do what good he could do. And, and nowadays, you know, yeah, there's all these multiverses of Spider-Man and multicultural Spider-Man and the idea that Spider-Man is more than one. And, mm. you know, anybody who gets bitten by a spider now can be Spider-Man. So if you want to be Spider-Man, all you have to do is find a radioactive spider and get bit <laughs> and make a costume and you're good to go. I think it's a little extreme, but I also understand that this is also commerce, that the comic companies are here to make money. They're not here to keep Peter Parker in a certain box the rest of his life. And given that everything, again, is all serialized, it has to broaden and it has to go further and it has to be bigger than when it started. Um, that having been said, I actually really liked the, uh, the movie. I thought the Spider-Verse movie was really great, but you'll notice it, took, it told the story from a particular point of view so it wasn't even our Peter Parker we were getting the story of. Right. It was more the, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Peter B. I want to say <laughs> Joe Torres. It wasn't Joe, <laughs> what, what's his name? Uh, uh, I can't uh, remember. Uh, the dude from um, uh, uh, Girl, what is it? New Girl. He was from New Girl. Uh, uh, well, no, just the, the name. What, what's his name? Uh, Spider-Man's name in the multiverse. Oh, uh, or that's in the, Spider the verse we saw. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's Peter Ben Parker. No, was it? No, it wasn't. The, the one with the it was, uh, The spider, the, the Spanish kid, the, who the movie was all about. Oh, Miles, Miles Morales. Miles, Miles Morales, sorry. there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's what I'm saying. It was all really from Miles's point of view. It wasn't necessarily from Peter Parker. Peter Parker was just a guest star in exactly, the Spider-Man yeah. multiverse movie, yeah, it was, it which was, there obviously were a few others. It was seeming like he was there to help, you know, big name on there so we can go see the rest of it and get sort of softly mm -hmm. introduced to it. Which is cool because that's the story they wanted to tell. And I was OK with that because they didn't try to reinvent Peter Parker because he, quote unquote, wasn't the focal point of that particular story. Right. So, I, yeah, I totally endorsed it and I loved uh, going to see that movie. You ready to see the next one? Because I'm, I'm, I already got the costume. I'm excited. Uh, uh, I'm sure they're uh, they're getting ready for the next three, <laughs> oh four, five, God. six of them. Yeah. So we won't be alive to see all of them. That's for no, sure. unfortunately, unfortunately not. <laughs> but uh, hey, I just want to thank you for stopping by today. It has been yeah, a pleasure, pleasure talking man. to you, man. It's been great seeing you, and I'm sure I'll see you again. weren't you, you were at, also at um, Galaxy Con in Raleigh when I saw you. Dude, I'm everywhere. You know, I've I'm, seen you in Atlanta. Uh, I've seen you in myself <laughs> out. Wherever they take me, you know, if they give me a room or something, I'll go. Whatever. Nice. nice. <laughs> so I can't wait to see you at the next con. Um, I will definitely be wearing um the new American costume. I even got the. Oh, get out of here! You have on, one. It's too hot to put on right now, but I got the uh I got the uh, jacket and the goggles. I was gonna get. Oh, a you mean the. Okay, sort of the the new new American. The new one, new. I don't have the, the space uh, suit. No, one. I don't have the space suit one. No, no, that one's a bit much oh. for me. You know what was a funny story there that John, um, when all of that came out, and that was the end of the, the first series, and of course, after the first series, everybody knows we have a black superhero and, and, and everything. So um, John and I had a con John Ridley had a, and I had a conversation that, okay, well, he can't really keep wearing the same costume because now that he's been exposed, there's no reason. You know, he, right. he probably wouldn't want to wear that. And I can't remember if it was me or John. I will defer to John, but one of us said, you know what, he should because this would have predated the Black Panthers. And he said, you know what, he should kind of look like a, a Huey Newton or somebody yeah. where it's just a leather jacket and 
and you know he's got a, a beret. I think I I did put the beret on him. You did. Where we we assumed that maybe Huey or or one of the uh, beginning Black Panther members kind of looked at the new American and said, "Damn, that's the look. That's the look <laughs> we got to do for our our thing. We're getting up here to us, uh, you know, do racial equality." Okay. So it was a funny way of suggesting that the new American actually influenced the Black Panthers. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally not true. Of course, there, there is no truth to that. <laughs> uh, I mean, hey, man, conspiracy. You're starting up one right there. <laughs> <laughs> that he actually existed. Exactly. exactly. Back Everybody's like, Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> right. You know, the government would do an experiments on all those people. I mean, it makes sense to give them all their super strength and make them vulnerable. That makes complete mm-hmm. sense. I was so mad. about Just that. so. See, see, and somebody doing a conspiracy just so a white man can shoot him in the chest and nothing will happen. To exactly. Him. That's why they did it. <laughs> That's basically what they talked about. I know I said I was closing <laughs> out, but anyways, that's basically what they were talking about on uh, Luke Cage, uh, the TV show when they went about it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, man. Don't get me wrong. I love my white brothers and sisters, of hey, course. Same, same. <laughs> it's always good to have a little fun. But, always good. Right, George, thank you for stopping by today. Thank you, Ravel. I appreciate the time, man. My pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do this in person and talk a little bit more. Yeah, next time. Let's definitely do it and do it longer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Have a good one. All right, my friend. Be good. Bye-bye. All right, guys. That was George's Jaunty. I hope you guys enjoyed that. All right, guys. That was George's Jaunty, and I hope you guys enjoyed that. I sure did. Can Can we get one more clap for George's Jaunty? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Anyways. So, you guys stay tuned. We'll be putting out more episodes like this, whether it's an interview, gaming, cosplayers coming on, artists. This is here for your entertainment. This is your host, Lavelle Gates, a.k.a. The Blurred with the Mouth, a.k.a. Blurred and Mouth, and I'll be talking to y'all soon. Peace.